thus far, as much as I have, it has been, uh, to me, very informative, and I believe beneficial. I have heard other comment, and so I believe that you feel the same way. I hope that you do, and, and hope that you will give these things uh, some thought, uh, meditate upon these lessons. They are as has already been mentioned, very beneficial to us. We know these books, as Brother Larry pointed out yesterday, that these books, of course, are, are often misunderstood and, and misapplied. We know that many people apply them to today, to our future, and we know that this is not what these texts are teaching on. Uh, but they are still uh, beneficial to us and inform us of many lessons that we can and, and in fact should learn and apply to our lives. If you will, bow with me as we go to God in prayer. Our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Father, humble we bow before you in prayer. We praise you, exalt you. We thank you so much for the opportunity to study your word, the opportunity that we've had over the past few days and continue to have today to study uh, the minor prophets, Father, we pray that we will study them, medita meditate upon these lessons, and apply them uh, where appropriate to our lives and live accordingly, Father. We pray that we may share your word with others, that they may come to know you, Father. It is in Christ's most precious and holy name we pray. Amen. The book of Haggai we are studying at this time. And it is not a lengthy book. It would take very uh, limited time to read through it, uh, even if you are not a very speedy reader. Uh, it is uh, two chapters, 38 verses in its entirety. And yet we see the importance of this book when we study it. And we see that this book is is the word of God. We ask the question, who wrote the book? And Haggai 1 and verse 1 tells us indeed that it was written uh, by Haggai in the second year of Darius, the king in the sixth month, in the first day of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai, the prophet, unto Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, saying, so we, he identifies here that it is written by Haggai. It is, this word was uh, given through Haggai. But we see in verse 1 that it is the word of God. And we need to understand the, the importance of that fact. And it is stressed in this book. Again, there's 38 verses in this book. And yet 26 times... In those 38 verses, it is said that it is the word of the Lord in one way or another. 26 times out of 38 verses. We understand from that that we need to be clear that it is God's word that is given here. And so it is very important uh, that we learn the message that is given in this book. Looking at the background, and, and of course this quarter we have been studying the book of Ezra in the Bible class on Sunday mornings, and as I have mentioned, we did that deliberately because it is the background to at least part of the books that we are studying at this time. And in fact, it is a background, it teaches us about 
the book we are studying now, Haggai, and then the book we will study next in the worship service, which is Zechariah. These books are, these two men were contemporary one with another. They worked at the same time, worked together. We see just briefly the background of this is that the children of Israel were not faithful, Judah specifically, at this time. They were not faithful to the Lord. And they were told, they were warned, as we have seen in some of the books uh, that we have been studying, Habakkuk, Nahum, where it deals with, in part at least, with the Babylonian captivity. They were told they were going to go into captivity. They were told the duration of it. They were told what was going to happen. And we need to understand that they were born, they needed to know that when they went back, they were going to, the remnant that would come back was going to rebuild the temple. And we know that Isaiah, in Isaiah 44 and <clears throat> verses 24 and through 45, verse 7, we know that Isaiah prophesied well over a hundred years before it took place that God would raise up his servant, Cyrus. God identified him, called him by name, Cyrus. That Cyrus would be raised up to send his people back. And we know that that's exactly what happened. You can go back to 2 Chronicles 36, Ezra chapter 1, and see the decree that Cyrus set forth to send them back. This would have been around, and there is, as we discussed in Ezra, there is some debate exactly the year that this took place, but approximately 538 or so B.C. They go back. They began the, the rebuilding. They laid the foundation, we're told. And yet they stopped. And there is discussion as to why they stopped. We know they faced difficulties, we'll say. Their adversaries were against them and did all they could to thwart these efforts because, well, they were their adversaries. And we know for 16 years they allowed this to continue. And that brings us to what we see here in the book of Haggai. And again, it is written by Haggai, and we know very little about him. His name means festive or festival. And again, the totality of what we know of him is found in this book, and then in Ezra chapter 5, verses 1 and 2, and chapter 6, verses 14 through 16, where it essentially tells us what we are seeing here, that, that Haggai and Zechariah worked at this time in order to aid with the rebuilding, in order to motivate the people. We look and see when it was written. As was mentioned over the past uh, three or four days, we know that there is debate about when these books were written, when these things were. There is, a, in some cases, a wide view of when they are, uh, when these books are written. This book, though, there is no debate about it. Haggai does not leave question as to when these events occurred. He gives the exact day that these things occurred. He gives the day, the month, and the year of these prophecies. We see in Haggai chapter 1 and verse 1, in the second year of Darius the king, looking at secular history, this comes to 520 B.C. But again, he doesn't simply say <coughs> the second year of Darius, he gives the month, the sixth month, and the first day of the month. Again, in verse 15, in the four and twentieth day of the sixth month, in the second year of Darius the king. 
Chapter 2, verse 1, In the seventh month, in the one and twentieth day of the month, came the word of the Lord by the prophet Haggai, saying, in verse 10, we see in the four and twentieth day of the ninth month, in the second year of Darius, and in verse 20, and again the word of the Lord came into Haggai in the four and twentieth day of the month. So Haggai gives us exact dating on the on his prophecies. We see likewise he is clear on who to whom the book is written. We see in verse 1 of chapter 1 that it is written this prophecy, this specific, and we see different prophecies in here, but this first one we see was specifically to Zerubbabel, who was the governor, and to Joshua, who was the high priest. We next see in verse 12 that it was to the people. Words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people did fear before the Lord. We see that he was, it was to all the people, to Zerubbabel, Joshua, and the residue, or the remnant of the people, chapter 2 and verse 2. So, we see that he tells us who it was written to. In verse 20 of chapter 2, And again the word of the Lord came unto Haggai in the four and twentieth day of the month, saying, Speak to Zerubbabel, governor of Judah. Verse 21. Specifically to Zerubbabel, that prophecy was to be spoken to. But we ask the question, why? Why was this book written? It's a... An important question to consider, and, and brothers and sisters, the truth of the matter is that it was written because the people were not doing what they were supposed to be doing. It was written to correct them in their error. Notice again this first prophecy beginning in verse 1. In the second year of Darius the king, in the sixth day, in the month, first month of the in the first day, excuse me, of the month, came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet unto Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and to Joshua the son of Josedek the high priest, saying, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saying, This people say, The time is not come, the time that the Lord's house should be built. Then came the word of the Lord by Haggai the prophet, saying, Is it time for you, O ye? to dwell in your sealed houses, and this house lie waste. Now therefore, thus saith the Lord of hosts, consider your ways, ye have sown much, and bring in little. Ye eat, but ye have not enough. Ye drink, but ye are not filled with drink. Ye clothe you, but there is none warm. And he that earneth wages, earneth wages to put it into a bag with holes. Verse 7, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Consider your ways. He is writing here to get them to understand that they have been in error, that they have not been faithful to Him, that they have not been doing what they were supposed to be doing. They had built themselves nice homes. Brother Haley in his commentary suggests that perhaps they were using the money that was set aside to build the Lord's house to build their own houses. Now it doesn't spell that out in the text here. But is it hard, is it difficult to imagine that that could be the case? That someone could do such a thing? We might think that would never happen. But brothers and sisters, it very well could happen. We see in the religious world today many who are so-called evangelists. Actually, they refer to themselves often as pastors. And what do they do? Money is given. And they have lavish homes, top-of-the-line private jets that they can fly around in, all ostensibly belonging to the church. 
And in reality, the church is their church and is no more than a cover for them to have this money. But whether they did spend the Lord's money to do it or not, they were caring for themselves, providing for themselves, and leaving the house of God to languish. Verse 8 here, God doesn't simply tell them to consider their ways, but He says, go up to the mountain and bring wood and build the house, and I will take pleasure in it, and I will be glorified, saith the Lord. He looked for much and to and lo, it came to little. And when ye brought it home, I did blow upon it. Why, saith the Lord of hosts, because of mine house that is waste, and ye run every man unto his own house. Therefore the heaven over you is stayed from dew, and the earth is stayed from her fruit. And I called for a drought upon the land, and upon the mountains and upon the corn and upon the new wine and upon the oil and upon that which the ground bringeth forth and upon men and upon cattle and upon the labor of of the hands. He's writing them to inform them that they are in error and they need to correct their ways and telling them if you will do this I'll take pleasure in these things. I will be pleased. We see likewise in chapter 2 and beginning with verse 10 that he rebukes them there as well. In the fourth and twentieth day of the ninth month in the second year of Darius came the word of the Lord by Haggai the, prop, the prophet saying, Thus saith the Lord of hosts, Ask now the priest concerning the law saying, If one bear holy flesh in the skirt of his garment, and with his skirt do touch bread, or pottage, or wine, or oil, or any meat, shall it be holy? And the priest answered and said, No. Then said Haggai, If one that is unclean by a dead body touch any of these, shall it be unclean? And the priest answered and said, It shall be unclean. Then answered Haggai and said, So is this people, and so is this nation before me, saith the Lord, and so is every work of their hands. And that which they offer, there is unclean. And now, verse 15, I pray you cons consider from this day and upward, from before us a stone was laid upon a stone in the temple of the Lord. Since those days were when one came to a heap of twenty measures, there were but ten. When one came to the press fat for to draw out fifty vessels out of the press, there were but twenty. I smote you with blasting and with mildew and with hail in all the labors of your hands. Yet ye turn not to me, saith the Lord. Consider now, from this day and upward, from the four and twentieth day of the ninth month, even from the day that the foundation of the Lord's temple was laid, consider it. Then he goes on and, and he says, he's going to bless them. They're doing what he wants them to do. He will bless them. He is trying to get them to understand that they need to correct their ways. It was commented yesterday that Brother Clint Yarborough in reference to the minor prophets, he asked the question, how many ways can you say repent or perish? And there's basically what we see throughout the, the minor prophets, that they are being told to repent or they're going to perish. And God is telling them, you haven't been faithful and these Things are occurring to you because you haven't been faithful. But just fix your ways. He also writes them to encourage them. He doesn't just tell them that you need to correct 
your ways. You need to learn how to improve. You need to, you need to do what you've been told because you're not doing it and I'm punishing you for it. He tells them, brothers and sisters, what it is they need to do in order to fix these things. Beginning there in verse 12 of chapter 1, we see that then Zerubbabel the son of Shealtiel and Joshua the son of Josedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God, and the words of Haggai the prophet as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people did fear before the Lord. Then spake Haggai the Lord's messenger in the Lord's message unto the people, verse 13, I think I said verse 12 earlier, but verse 13 there, speaking to the people, saying, I am with you, saith the Lord. And the Lord stirred up the spirit of Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, governor of Judah, and the spirit of Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, and the spirit of all the remnant of the people. And they came and did work in the house of the Lord of hosts, their God. In the four and twentieth day of the sixth month, in the second year of Darius the king. They start working and God encourages them. And does so twice more in the book here. Encouraging them. Both Joshua, the high priest, and Zerubbabel, the governor, and the people as a whole. The remnant, at least. You see, and we, we, we should know this, shouldn't we? We see it throughout the word of God. When man disobeys God, he is going to to suffer the consequences, we'll say. God is going to punish him. We see this throughout the Old Testament. The children of Israel time and time again disobey, time and time again turned their backs on God, went off chasing after false gods, went and did many things that was contrary to God's word. And God punished them for doing so. He had told them that this would occur had he not. Leviticus 26, Deuteronomy 28. And indeed, over and over they did. But what did he tell them? Do what I, you're, I've told you. Do what you're supposed to do. And I'll bless you. And when they would turn back to God, he did exactly what he said he would do. And he blessed them. He encouraged them. He reminded them that He was their God. He wants them to understand that. He knows who He is. And today, brothers and sisters, He wants us to understand that. We look at these things. We see why it was written, but again, understand that these books, Haggai and the Minor Prophets, were all written to different ones, to Israel, the northern kingdom in some cases, the southern kingdom in some cases, written to, uh, in some cases, such as what we see some in here, here in Haggai, to specific individuals. They were written to them about them. Now some, as we're going to see, especially when we get into Zechariah and the uh, worship service, we're going to see, and, and Haggai touches on some of this as well, points to Jesus and His coming. And we need to understand, it doesn't tell of some future event from where we are. But these are still lessons that we can learn. And we may ask, what lessons... Can we learn, brothers and sisters? We can learn that when we are faithful, that God will bless us. Now, I want to be careful about that. I'm always leery, and I think sometimes, I've noticed over the years on various subjects that sometimes we are so afraid of giving in to error that, that the denominational world is preaching that we refrain from, from saying where it is. Kind of the pendulum swinging back and forth. I, I don't 
you, you ever watch, I, I don't remember what it's called, but there in school, I remember seeing where the little metal balls, and you take one, draw it back, and it would slap, and it just knocked the end. On each end, it would move them, showing that the energy was going through the middle ones into the outer ones. But that's basically a pendulum, isn't it? Swinging back and forth. And sometimes we do that. We are so hesitant to go way out here, well, way out here in left field, that we swing too far the other way. Brothers and sisters, the denominational world, many in the denominational world, preach what we know and we've studied before as the prosperity doctrine. That is that if you'll send in a thousand dollars, God's going or you know, God's going to give you ten thousand. I've often said, I'll say again this morning, that the ones who get prosperous from the prosperity doctrine is the ones who are preaching the prosperity doctrine. They get rich off of that. And we shouldn't, we shouldn't look to that. That is not what the Bible is about. That is not what the Bible teaches. But because they corrupt that, we hesitate to say that he does, in fact, show that when you are faithful to him, he will bless you. We've seen that numerous times, brothers and sisters, and Haggai points that out. Here in, in chapter 1, there in chapter 2, as we've already read through, what does he say? You haven't built the house, my house. You've let it lie waste. You run to your own houses. You, you live in your sealed houses while my house is lying waste. And because of that, all these things, your crops, all, you know, the, well, the King James uses the word corn. As Jim was pointing out to me, they didn't have corn at the time. So at their, in their area, it was grain. I believe that's right, didn't you tell me, Jim? Corn wasn't in that area. He's confirming that. They did not have corn there. But the King James translates it to corn. But their, their crops weren't growing, weren't producing like it should. It talks about their wine, their grapes weren't producing as they should. They went and they thought they'd get 50. They only got 20. They thought they'd get 20. Well, they got a lot less than that. And it was because they were not living faithfully, brothers and sisters. It was because they were not doing what God had told them to do. And you and I today need to understand that that is still a true statement. Not that this particular thing applies directly to you or me, because this is talking to them. But are we not taught that God expects us to be faithful and when we fail to do so there are consequences? Of course, <clears throat> I do want to make this point. We can talk about the physical consequences of our sins, of our lack of faithfulness. But brothers and sisters, what is the greatest consequence to our lack of faithfulness? Our greatest, the greatest consequence is that we are separated from God and unless we correct that, we'll all perish. Or at least those who are will spend eternity in hell. They, one might say, but what did they do wrong? They weren't out doing something sinful. They weren't out killing and they weren't out stealing and, and all of that uh, you know again barring perhaps they were spending the money that was meant for God's house on their own houses but take that aside and let's say for a moment they weren't doing that they just simply weren't building the house <clears throat> what sin is there in that remember though what James says in James 4 and verse 17 therefore to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not to him it is sin when we know that something is right and it needs to be done and we don't do it, we are in fact 
sinning, brothers and sisters. We are sinning. Just as sure as God said, don't do this, and we do it, when He tells us to do something, when He expects us to do what is good, and we don't do it, we are still sinning. <coughs> another lesson, and we're rapidly running out of time here, but another lesson we learn is that God's Word works. God's Word works. Notice what happens here. Haggai comes there in chapter 1, tells them, beginning there in verse 2, Thus speaketh the Lord of hosts, saved, and identifies them. We're not going to reread it. But tells them again, they're living in their sealed houses while his house lies in ruin. And, and their answer to that is, well, it isn't time to build. You say it isn't time to build. But notice in verse 12 what happens when he tells them all of this. Then Zerubbabel, the son of Shealtiel, and Joshua, the son of Josedek, the high priest, with all the remnant of the people, obeyed the voice of the Lord their God. And the words of Haggai the prophet, as the Lord their God had sent him, and the people did fear before the Lord. They obeyed. They were told. You need to change your ways. You need to consider your ways, he tells him twice here. Tells them twice here in, in chapter 1. Consider your ways. Here's what you're doing wrong. Here's what you need to be doing. And what they do? They obey. It was pointed out, I don't remember which one of the brothers uh, pointed out, I believe yesterday, that we look, and I, maybe it was Brother Larry, I'm not sure, but we look for some new way to handle things, don't we? We look for some new way of attracting people and getting them here. And the truth of the matter is, brothers and sisters, this right here is all we need. We understand there will be many, in fact, most will reject, and the Word teaches us that, most will reject His Word. Most will reject Him. Isn't that not what God told Samuel? 1 Samuel 8, there verse 6, I believe it is. They don't reject you, Samuel. They're rejecting me. The Word of God is sufficient, and it is it works. And we're told that in the New Testament. In 2 Peter chapter 1 and verse 3, it, we're told that He's given us all things pertaining to life and godliness. Paul to Timothy, 2 Timothy chapter 3 and verse, verses 16 and 17. We're told all Scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for doctrine, for proof, for correction, for instruction in righteousness. That the man of God may be what? Perfect. Complete. Thoroughly furnished unto all good works. He is completely furnished to everything he needs to know in order to be pleasing to God. I don't need something new. I have the Word of God here. And when it is proclaimed, when the Word of God is preached, it works. Now again, we understand that there are those who will reject the truth, but it will still serve its purpose, and God's Word tells us that fact. Haggai is a very beneficial book to us, brothers and sisters. It's not a lengthy book. Again, two chapters and 38 verses. A total of 38 verses. And yet we find much that we can learn, that we can apply to ourselves today. Though it was written to them in that day, 520 B.C., it is still, a, the lessons can still be applied to us today. And we could look at so much more if we had more time. But brothers and sisters, I hope these things that we've seen thus far 
will be helpful and encouraging, informative to each of you. And I thank you for your attention. We're going to be dismissed. Thank <laughs> you.